If you do have a Bible, yeah, turn to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. Um, also, uh, Matthew 19 will be there as well. Uh, today we begin a, uh, a new series on God and sex. And I, you know, I don't think there is a more contested space in our culture and society, except for maybe race, uh, than in talks and debates around sexuality, and particularly in the church. We will say, and I will say, a lot of things in the next four weeks, things that may make you angry, um, may fill you with confusion or curiosity, maybe even courage. Um, many people may be reminded of the trauma that they experienced in the church around the area of sexuality, whether that if you grew up in the church in like the late 90s, early 2000s around the purity culture movement, like true love weight sort of movement. And there's a lot of trauma around that, a lot of shame around that, a lot of fear around that. Um, or if you're part of the church and have had tons of questions and wrestled with the LGBTQI conversation, or even been a, a part of the church and experienced sexual abuse, um, I know that this conversation brings up a lot of that in the church. Uh, I should start by letting you know kind of where I'm coming from in this series and where the series is going, what, like what the hope of the series is. So I'll, I'll start with where I'm coming from so you know uh, who I am and where I'm coming from in this series. Uh, I'm a local pastor and I pastor here in San Francisco and it's been one of the greatest joys of my life and it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life at the same time. And as a pastor, I hope to teach our church the way of Jesus. So if you have any questions about in and about this series, I'm typically available afterwards up here or in the back. And um, we are a church that is are trying to follow the way of Jesus. And I'm a pastor that's just trying to pastor people into the way of Jesus. So uh, as a pastor of a Christian church, Jesus' teachings are our highest authority. They're higher than culture and higher than politics and even higher than the law. Like it is the law for Christians, the law of love. So if you're new here, this series is one pastor's attempt, my attempt, at shepherding people into the way of Jesus, and specifically people who live in this very crazy land called San Francisco. <laughs> my two hopes for this series are ministry and teaching are the two hopes that I have for this series, ways that I've been praying. Uh, it's been my prayer that the spirit of the living God would minister to people in this series that you and I would encounter God. That's like my, my prayer. And that we would be taught by the scriptures. So these two things Jesus holds all throughout his ministry, that he would minister to people, people through healing, that he would minister through, to people through the, his presence, that he would minister through people, to people through his love, and he would teach them. He would say things like, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Or he would say things like, as it says in the beginning. Or he would quote the Psalms. Or he would quote Deuteronomy, which is like one of his favorite books. You need both of these. You need teaching and ministry. If you just have one, if you just have teaching, it, the, the church can come off as cold. Like, what's your doctrinal statement on this? That's so cold. But if you just have ministry, it can get very sentimental. It could just be all the feels, like, oh, I feel God, but we don't really know what we're doing with that. We just feel them, and this is how I'm feeling. This is where I feel like God's leading me. You need both teaching and ministry. So as a part of this series, there's going to be two lectures. Uh, lectures that have the elders' full endorsement. Both Sam Alberry and John Tyson will come in and say things way better than I can say them. Um, Sam Alberry will be teaching on August 26th on God in the gay community. And we need a lot of wisdom around this topic and this subject um, in our church and in our city. And so he'll be coming and teaching and lecturing on that with a Q&A. And on September 3rd, John Tyson from New York will be here teaching on sexual formation that will tie in to this series. That's right after Labor Day. So make sure you get, you get back. I think everyone gets back on Monday. You should get back on Monday, by the way, from Labor Day. And uh, it's that Tuesday night, September 3rd. Lastly, there's one practice I want to invite you to participate in throughout this series. And it is the practice of fasting. I want to invite the entire church into fasting on Wednesdays. And I don't mean fasting Netflix and like carbs um, I'm, and chocolate. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about fasting 
food. For 2,000 years, when the church talked about fasting, it had to do with food, okay? So fasting food for 24 hours. Now, let me tell you what the, how this works, because some people get this confused. Some people get a 24-hour fast confused with a 36-hour fast, okay? So 20, a 24-hour fast starts, to, you eat Tuesday night dinner, okay? And then you don't eat again for 24 hours, what would put you at Wednesday night dinner. So you basically fast 24 hours. So some people think a fast is, uh, I eat dinner Tuesday night, and I don't get to eat breakfast until Thursday. That would be a 36-hour fast. A 24-hour fast, you're like, well, that sounds easy. Your 24-hour fast sounds really easy. I know. <laughs> Anyone can do it. Uh, I'm at Enneagram 7, and fasting is like, uh, like, a f uh, like the worst fate you can give me, right? He's like, well, you fast? I'm like, no. I, my goal is uh, like five times a year. And I had a friend challenge me and say, try once a week. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. But I've started doing that. Here's what fasting does. Fasting gets, uh, has a way of getting uh, Christianity into your actual body. So the problem with uh, a lot of things that we'll be talking about as we get later on in the series, lust and addiction to pornography, addiction to sexual uh, promiscuity, all this stuff. The problem is you don't know how to live in your body in a way where you've denied your flesh. Because everything you say yes to, you say yes to pretty quickly. And food is a way of saying when you deny food and are dependent on God, you learn how to live in self-control very practically. So what happens is you start fasting food and by indirection, you start learning how to live within the boundaries of like your body saying no to the flesh. Now, I'm not saying you start fasting and then all of a sudden pornography goes away, but if you struggle with pornography, and I know so many people in this church do, both men and women, um, you, you, have to, you have agency in this. I don't know if God will heal you when you come up forward and you get prayer and, and you're instantly uh, sober and uh, free from the addiction of pornography. Typically, that, that happens sometimes. It's very rare. Typically, God uses your agency and your spiritual development and your sanctification to free you from something like pornography. One of the ways we get there is through fasting. So, I want to ask the church, uh, if you would, fast, eat Tuesday night dinner, and then break fast on Wednesday night dinner. 24-hour fast, okay? So I invite the whole church into that. So tonight, today, I want to start uh, with a little less controversial teaching and build from here. And I'd like to teach on wisdom around sexuality, not information. We have a lot of information. I'm talking about wisdom. So let's read our text, Genesis 1, 26 through 31, and um, then I'll pray. 26, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and to all the birds in the sky and to all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Let's pray. Lord, I know uh, we, we all come with a myriad of like experiences, thoughts, proclivities, um, desires when it comes to topics around sex and sexuality. And so I just want to pray for our wisdom right now. I know that there's so many broken hearts in here, um, so much unrequited love in here, so much um, pain in here, and for some, a lot of joy in here around this topic and I pray we would sit under your scriptures and Holy Spirit, you would teach us that you would free us 
um, from the things that our culture puts around us to, that bind us, that just keep us in captivity. Free us, set us free by your spirit. May there be the freedom of Christ in here. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. And I pray, Lord, I, I just submit all of my self to you, my mind, my capacities, my body, all of it to you. I pray it would be under submission of the Spirit. Anoint me to teach and, and communicate your, your scriptures and the powerful name of Christ. Amen. 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 What I want to talk about today is the future of sex. As in, what is the future of sex? It seems that since the 1960s, with its epicenter in San Francisco, mainstream Western culture has been trying to rid itself of the taboos and constraints around sex and sexuality, except for, obviously, consent. In an article on Medium.com entitled, Sex Robots Could Save Your Relationship, and more good news on the future of love, the author writes to explain how all the taboos of sex and sexuality in the near future will be fully thrown off and the sexual revolution will finally be realized. The article uses these subheadings to talk about the future of sex. She writes, the future of sex is beyond monogamy. The future sex will be beyond monogamy. She writes that not only has marriage been revolutionized over the past two decades with gay marriage, but marriage is going to keep changing to reflect a population that's more mobile and lives longer than ever before. She says entering into a monogamous relationship forever simply won't be pragmatic. She says that this is already obvious to many millennials who don't necessarily regard monogamy as the only way to find love. She says that the future of sex will be beyond binary gender. She says this is embodied recently in, by the actor-musician Janelle Monet coming out as pansexual, meaning she's attracted to people on a spectrum of genders. She writes that in 50 years, when kids are growing up with pansexual grandparents, bisexuality may seem outmoded. Pansexuality is likely the tip of the iceberg when it comes to identifying new sexual preferences, she promises. She says the future of sex will be beyond humans. She says if pansexuality sounds strange, what about digisexuality? Quote, using technology, we could decouple our desire for intimacy from our sexual needs. By the way, this is robots, if you didn't know. I'm sure you know. I'm sure you've read about this. But she said through sex with robots... Uh, we could decouple our desire for intimacy from our sexual needs. We might find that we make better choices as a result. And lastly, she says, the future of sex will be beyond a romance. Now, this one's my favorite, honestly. This one's my favorite. And I'm serious because she says, this is how she ends her article. She says that one day in the future, sex will be so whatever that, we, that we'll move beyond relationships being all about romantic sex and love and get to a place where friendship is the most important thing, not sex. I was like, wait, what? I was not expecting that at all at the end of this article. <laughs> I'm reading this thinking, whoa, she's like talking about heaven. And I don't think she's wrong about this one, by the way. Now, for those of us who swim in the culture, cultural milieu of SF, these things come as no great surprise. I'm reading them and some of you are like, yeah, of course. Like we talk about this all the time at my tech startup company or whatever. <laughs> now, though you might not agree with where some of this is going, for the most part, our, our culture has shifted drastically on what sex is and what sex means. In fact, no generation in history has been through as much cultural change as we have since around the 1960s. Think of the rise of the internet and AI and the Human Genome Project, etc. And there is no place this is most profoundly felt than in and around sex. There have been three major shifts in the way we experience sex in the last 50 years. Ronald Rollheiser points out in his new book. He says, sex has had three major shifts. The first one is sex has been disconnected from childbearing and family. Now, you have to realize and remember that birth control only dates back to 1960 when the FDA approved the first oral contraceptive. And it wasn't until 1972 that the su Supreme Court legalized it for single people. I mean, for most of human history, it was not an option 
to experience sex without at least a high risk of long-term responsibility, meaning a child. (laughs) Think about that. (laughs) For most of human history, sex was coupled with the reality of a living responsibility called a child, which has, now this in itself has all kinds of effects that barely right now millennial, this millennial generation is, is feeling the effects of this, but this has all sorts of effects on sex and sexuality. Most importantly, sex is primarily tied to pleasure, not procreation. The, the second drastic shift in sex has been, sex has been disconnected from marriage. Listen, sex and marriage have been connected for almost every single culture and religion in the world. And this is still true today for the followers of Jesus and for the Dalai Lama and Islamic culture, etc. Now again, there's all sorts of, uh, of effects on sex and even our sexuality because of this shift. But more than anything, what this shift has done is created, it has created an anxiety around our sexuality. Because both, it, the, both the science and the theology of sex says that sex creates soul ties. Your brain is wired to connect during sex. Something that scripture has been teaching for a long time, but just not with scientific words. There are scientific language words and research around how your body is wired to connect during sex. The biggest shift, in my opinion, around sex has been the third one. Sex has been disconnected from love, emotion, relational commitment, and even humans. Donna Friedas, in her best-selling book, The End of Sex, has a great summary on in, in and around the most recent data on this. She says that more and more people are delaying marriage to focus on their career. And during that hiatus, which lasts somewhere between 10 to 20 years post-graduation, they still want sex, but with no love or emotion or relationship because all of those things are too time-consuming. They're too hard. They're, they're, They're hard work. They're messy and they're exclusive. However, she writes in her book, Eventually, they want to tie sex with commitment in a loving relationship, but right now, they just don't have the time for that. So they'll just take the sex. Now, her book is about what decisions and a worldview like this is doing to a whole generation. And her subtitle says it all. Her subtitle is, How Hookup Culture is Leaving a Generation Unhappy, Sexually Unfulfilled, and Confused About Intimacy. It's a research book. But but the way that we've found a way of hacking this I don't want to confuse this stuff with intimacy thing is uh, sex with robots. And what I mean by that is that, I mean, this, we think I don't want to get involved in another personality, another person. And so there's a huge, there is a rise in um, sex with robots. I mean, it didn't really end well in Ex Machina or the movie Her, but whatever, we don't care. Like, it didn't work out well for them, but, you know, us, it'll be different. But one of the saddest manifestations of this desire for sex without emotional or relational commitment is pornography. Young people in America today are having less sex than they have had in, like, 50 years. And before you think, okay, youth group sex talks must be working, (laughs) when you actually find out why this is true, it's because of pornography. And kids don't know how to relate anymore. So it's really hard to flirt with someone and have sex when you don't know how to talk with people. So those two things have decreased sex a lot in this generation, um, in this young generation. Now, I have to be honest with all this. Now, of course, you may be thinking, I mean, you're an intelligent group of people. Haven't people been doing all this stuff since like the beginning of time? Haven't people found a way to have sex and not get pregnant throughout history? Haven't people have been having sex outside of marriage since like page 11 of the Bible? <laughs> like, isn't sexual promiscuity, sexual fluidity, sexual exploration, that's like nothing new. And you're right. None of those things are new. But here's what's new. And um, Rollheiser points this out, and I agree. What's new about everything I just said about these shifts when it comes to sex and sexuality? 
What's new is that all of these shifts are being understood and hailed as moral progress, a liberation from darkness. And what's being said quite often, especially in very progressive circles, and it's interesting to me because ironically, progressives today seem like culture's new fundamentals. If you're not progressive, they will kick you out and shame you if you do not believe what they believe. Progressive today, progressive today in progressive circles is saying that anyone that holds to the traditional or orthodox view of sex is in need of moral and psychological enlightenment. You are not just regressive, you are harmful. Not only are you harmful, what you're saying is hateful. So if you believe what, what the scriptures teach or what society has teached or cultures across the world have teach and are taught around sexuality or sex for thousands of years, you are considered dangerous. And what the, 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 the weirdest shift has taken, that's taken place is that the progressive culture is now judging the church. Where it has not the fact that the church should judge progressive culture, but it's been like that since forever. But now progressive culture is actually judging the church. No, you don't go far enough. You are not liberated enough. You are regressive and hateful on all of that stuff. Now, it is my understanding that all of this progress in sex, as a pastor, I say this, it's not only wrong, but I believe it's naive. It neither is honest about the emotional and psychological power of sex, nor the physiological reality of sex. In other words, what sex does to our souls and what sex does to our body. Therefore, I believe what we need is a wisdom around sexuality and spirituality, an integration of these two, because I think sexuality and spirituality are tied together. Again, my, my guy, Rollheiser. This is probably one of the best, no, it is. It is the best quote on sexuality that I've ever read. And here it is. It's from his book called The Holy Longing. I recommend it to anyone who is under the age of 30. Read this book. He says this. Sexuality, now if you're over 30, listen to this quote still. <laughs> I hear some people over 30 like, wait, what? I don't have to listen? Listen. This is what he says. Sexuality lies at the center of the spiritual life. I'm going to read this again. Sexuality lies at the center of the spiritual life. A healthy sexuality is the single most powerful vehicle there is to lead us to selflessness and joy. Just as unhealthy sexuality helps consolate selfishness and unhappiness and does nothing else. We will be happy in this life depending on whether or not we have a healthy sexuality. One of the fundamental tasks of spirituality, therefore, is to help us understand and channel our sexuality correctly. This is, however, no easy task. Sexuality is such a powerful fire that is not always easy to channel in life-giving ways. It is ve its very power, and it's the most powerful force on the planet, makes it a force not just for formidable love, life, and blessing, but also for the worst hate, death, and destruction imaginable. Sex is responsible for most of the ecstasies that occur on this planet, but is also responsible for lots of murders and suicides. It is the most powerful of fires, the best of all fires, the most dangerous of all fires, and a fire which ultimately lies at the base of everything, including the spiritual life. What strikes me most about this quote from the very first time I read it years ago was Rollheiser's linking of sex, sexuality, and spirituality. Pastors are famous for saying that we worship sex in our culture, that our culture worships sex. But pastors, what we have often failed to do is to help congregations connect their spirituality with their sexuality. So what do we do with our sexuality? We can't ignore it. We can't repress our sexuality. That would be wrong. That would be inhuman. And according to Rollheiser, it would be very unspiritual. But nor can we give our sexuality freedom to do whatever it feels, whenever it wants to. This is what the sexual liberation has tried to do. 
sex and sexuality without limits, without consequence, without taboos. This is dangerous because sexuality without limits is like a life without limits. It will collapse under its own weight of self-centeredness like a black hole. And this is the very thing we are seeing in Hollywood with the Me Too movement. A whole industry partially and practically built on sexual exploitation and sexual liberation falling in on itself. So what we are saying is that in order to have health in our sexuality, we can neither repress it nor can we simply liberate it. Because sexuality lies at the heart of what it means to be human. Sexuality is right next to our instinct for breathing. And it's ever present in our lives. And so what we need is a wisdom in our sexuality. We need to recover what it means that our sexuality and our spirituality are deeply tied together. Deborah Hirsch in her book Redeeming Sex gives definitions for sexuality and spirituality. I'm going to read them to you and tell me what you notice. I mean, don't say it out loud, but just think about it. <laughs> sexuality, she says, is defined, sexuality is, she says, can be described as the deep desire and longing that drives us beyond ourselves in an attempt to connect with, to understand that which is other than ourselves. Essentially, it is a longing to know and be known by other people on a physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual levels. Here's how she defines spirituality. Spirituality can be described as the vast longing that drives us beyond ourselves in an attempt to connect with, to probe, and to understand our world. Beyond that, it is the inner compulsion to connect with the eternal other that is God. Essentially, it is the longing to know and be known by God on physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual levels. Now, you might be thinking, aren't those kind of the same thing? And I think that's the point. They are the same thing. Now, it's been said in many circles very flippantly that when we're talking about sex and sexuality, that we need to lighten up about sex in the church because Jesus doesn't say that much about sex. To think that, I think, would be very, very wrong. And missing the forest for the trees. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. We need to couple this the idea of spirituality and sexuality. Now, a little, little note about Jesus and his teachings. Oftentimes, many times, Jesus uses an economy of words when he teaches. Meaning, he says a lot with a little. For example, the Sermon on the Mount is like his magnum opus for life in God's kingdom. And you can read it in 14 minutes. Except it will take you volumes of writing to unpack it. Years to explain it. And a lifetime of grace to practice and master it. But he says it in 14 minutes. In the same way, what Jesus says about marriage, sex, gender, and the telos of our bodies, the purpose of our bodies, he says in just two verses. I read these verses a few weeks ago in our marriage sermon, but let's look at, look at it again. Matthew 19, 1 through 7. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. And as always, large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to test him, okay? Remember from a few weeks ago, they come to Jesus to catch him in a, a test, a lie, a trap, to trap him with his own words, to show the world that he's not worth his salt as a teacher. And they say to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus says in response, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, I already unpacked this a few weeks ago, but I just want to point out a few things. The first thing that Jesus says about uh, getting in a conversation that encompasses all of this stuff, that encompasses marriage, that encompasses divorce, that encompasses sexuality, that encompasses sex, that encompasses gender. He says this, there is a creator, God. He is the creator God and you are the created ones. You are creatures, he is God. We have to make sure we get this right. You are created, he is the creator that shifts everything. That should change the conversation. Let's go back to the beginning. God, who is eternal, creates you. This is why our series is called God and Sex. God, the uncreated eternal one in sex, something that is created and will only last for a limited time. God and sex. Jesus says, creator God, he's the created one. And us, we're creatures. We are the created. And sex, he says, sex, marriage, 
is a one flesh union of man and woman in marriage for life. Now, I know this brings up a host of questions and thoughts, I'm sure, but hang on a second. If you're new to the Bible, there's a word in Greek, it's the word porneia, but it's the word translated sexual immorality that's used over and over again in the New Testament and the Old Testament Jews, but it's not, obviously not called porneia because that's Greek. Sexual immorality. And what this word it means is sex outside of the way it's supposed to be. Now the question is, what is sex supposed to be? Or another way of asking that question is, what is sex? Like, what's the meaning of it? What's the purpose of it? Why is it here? Why do we have it? Again, created by a creator. So there's a telos to our sex life. There's a telos to our body. We'll get into that in a few weeks. Now, the word sex has a Latin root that literally means to cut off, to sever, to amputate, to disconnect from the whole. So to be sexed, therefore, is literally, literally means to be cut off, to be severed from, to be amputated from the whole. So if you were to take, for example, if you take a branch and you cut it off from a tree, you would have sexed the branch, right? If this branch woke up the next day on the ground, severed and cut off and disconnected, a lonely piece of wood which was once a part of a great organism, you can say that branch was sexed. This lone branch would wake up knowing that with everything in its being, every cell of its being, that it, if it wanted to continue living and if it wanted to produce flowers and bear fruit, it must somehow reconnect itself to the tree. Okay, are you with me? Like sex is to be cut off. Now, what is the great interconnectedness that we were all connected to? And the answer from the text we read at the very beginning, Genesis 1, the answer is everything. There was a time when you, when humanity was connected to everything. The Bible opens up with an interconnected world, an interconnected reality. Humanity connected with each other and with God and with the environment. The Hebrew word for this is shalom. And this is what Jesus is pointing back to when he's teaching in Matthew 19. In the beginning, there was shalom, perfect wholeness. Now, our strong desire for sex, especially once we reach puberty, is our painful awareness that every cell of our body and our psyche and our soul is sexed. That, that we're cut off. Sex in its basic form is the dimension of our awareness, most times subconscious, that we have been cut off. Now, secular philosopher Alain de Bouton even recognizes this when he writes that primal sex is overcoming the basic isolation that every human feels. In his book uh, called How to Think More About Sex, which I think is a great title, he, he says this, I'm going to read it. It's, it's a fairly long chunk of, of text. It's not on the screen. Just listen. Just, I think this is beautifully written and well said. He says this, isolation is something we all become acquainted with after the end of childhood. If we are lucky, we begin comfortably enough on this earth in a state of close physical and emotional union with the devoted caregiver. We lie naked on her skin. We can hear her heartbeat. We can see the delight in her eyes as she watches us do nothing more accomplished than blow a saliva bubble. <laughs> in other words, than merely exist. Our fingers are tickled and the fine hairs of our head are stroked, smelt, and kissed. We don't even have to speak. Our needs are carefully interpreted. The breast is there whenever we want it. I, I'm obviously thinking of my daughter, Junie, who this is her life right now. So close to Ashley, so interconnected. She's starting to say, exactly. She's starting to say, <laughs> she's starting to say mama right now. And so we'll, we'll do, her and I will be playing on the ground and uh, rolling around and playing with toys. And she just gets over me. I don't know how long, like eight minutes or something. And she's just over me. She's like, mom, 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 mom. I'm like, no, this is daddy time. This is like, we're not, mama is not, is daddy. And she just starts, she doesn't cry, but she's just going, she starts, mama. Like she wants, there's like this interconnectedness that she has. No, Alain de Bouton says, that's how we all wake up into the world. But this is, listen to what he says next. 
And this is all Edenic, Edenic language. Like he uses language from Eden. He says, then gradually comes the fall. The nipple is taken away and we are blithely introduced to move on to rice and morsels of dry chicken. <laughs> our, body is e our body either ceases to please or can no longer be so casually displayed. We grow ashamed of our particularities. Ever-expanding areas of our outer selves are forbidden to be touched by others. It begins with the genitals, then spreads, compass the stomach, the back of the neck, the ears, the armpits, until all we are allowed to do is occasionally give someone a hug, shake hands, or bestow or receive a peck on the cheek. The signs of other satisfaction in our existence declines as well, and their enthusiasm begins to be linked to our performance. It is what we do rather than who we are that is now an int of interest to them. Our teachers, once so encouraging about our smudgy drawing of ladybirds and our scrawls depicting flags of the world, seem to take pleasure only in our exam results. Well-meaning individuals brutally suggest that perhaps it is time for us to start earning some money of our own and society is unkind or kind to us chiefly according to how successful we turn out to be doing just that. We begin to have to monitor what we say and how we look. There are aspects of our appearance that revolt and terrify us and that we feel we have to hide from others by spending money on clothes and haircuts. We grow into clumsy, heavy-footed, shameful, anxious creatures. We become adults, definitively expelled from paradise. But deep inside, we never forget the needs with which we were born. To be accepted as we are, without regard to our deeds, to be loved through the medium of our body, to be enclosed in another's arms, to occasion delight with the smell of our skin, and all of those needs inspiring our relentless and passionately idealistic quest for someone to kiss and sleep with. Now, what Elaine is saying is that we are sexed, and that's how we wake up in, a wor in the world. And for a short time, our caregivers provide that connectedness if we're fortunate. But what we are all longing for is to be unsexed, to be connected, to be brought back into shalom. And this part of the experience of being human, and it is the human condition, this is exceedingly painful. Being sexed, living with this is painful. The loneliness it brings, the irrational longing it brings, the madness that is our sexuality. We want to be with sometimes, sometimes more than someone. We long to be with everyone. Rollheiser famously says, it is no great surprise that our sexuality is so grandiose that it would have us want to make love to the whole world. Isn't that our real goal? Like our sexuality can't be contained. We want to make love to the whole world. Now, if this is true about our sexuality, and I believe it is, then we can see that our sexuality is more than simply having sex. It is important, if we desire to be wise around sex, that we know the difference between having sex and having a sexuality. Our culture conflates the, true, the two. It is not true biblically. It is not true philosophically. See, we started by saying that we cannot be whole without being healthy sexually, and that's correct. But we think that what it means to be healthy sexually is by having healthy sex. And this is a tragic reduction. Sexuality, which we all have, is a drive for love, communion, community, friendship, family, affection, wholeness, consummation, creativity, self-perpetuation, joy, delight, humor, and self-transcendence. It is not good to be alone. That's a quote from Genesis. And when God said that, he meant about that about every man and woman and child and animal and insect and plant and atom and molecule in the entire universe. In any field of study, we know this is true. It is not good to be alone. Sex is the energy inside of us that works insistently against our being alone. Now, this is why having sex is so powerful. Now, follow me. Having sex is not the whole of sexuality, but it is probably the most powerful and potent opportunity for immediate intimacy. And I would say immediate genuine intimacy. When you're having sex, experiencing orgasm with another human, you feel probably in one of the most intense ways available, this side of heaven, unsexed. 
When you're with another human, completely naked, completely one physically, you feel your brain is wired to make all this very real to you. You feel at that moment unsexed. You feel unalone. You feel connected. This is why the scriptures liking, liken sexual language of the oneness between the sexes to describe our ultimate union with God. So when, when, when the scriptures talk about how we become one with God, it uses the same language as becoming one with another human in the act of sex. That's powerful. Which brings you back to the future of sex. What is the future of sex? In Matthew 22, the religious leaders approach Jesus to trap him in another lie or trap him again in his own teaching. The, the group that comes to Jesus are called the Sadducees and the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. And so they ask him a question about the, like, the quote resurrection that they don't believe in. They said, Jesus, uh, there's a, I have a question about a woman who married a man and he died and then she married another man and he died and then she married another man and he died. Who will she be married to in the resurrection? Now, this is a perfect setup for a joke, by the way. I mean, a perfect setup for a joke. But Jesus doesn't bite because he's way above all that, right? So I, I, would, I would tell a joke at this point, but he doesn't do that. He just goes right into this. He says this, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Okay, so I just want to stop there. See, we started by saying that we need um, ministry and teaching. And Jesus couples these things too. The you don't know the power of God, the power of the presence of God, the power that is available to us when God comes near, when God makes his love real to us, that power, that thing that we feel, the, the, uh, the, the powerful affection that, that happens in our lives. You don't know that. And you don't know the scriptures. You're not taught. You don't, know, you don't know what the scriptures say. You need both of these things. He says, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, what Jesus is saying is that there is a day coming where the things on this earth that couple us, that make us feel connected, one, marriage, and sex, will be integrated and subsumed into a greater reality. That is Christ marrying his bride, the church. And those two becoming one. In the future, what will happen is there's no, there will no longer be marriage. You will still be engendered. You will still be male and female in the new heavens and the new earth. But no longer will you be married. No longer will we, will we marry each other for we will be married to Jesus. And the thing that happens in sex and marriage, the connectedness that happens, we will have that. And heaven won't be less than earth. The new heavens and the new earth won't be less than we have on earth. It'll be more. So there'll be something about how this beautiful connectedness, like what happened in the garden, but more so, will happen with everyone who is in Christ. There's a day coming where all who trust in Christ for our salvation will be unsexed in the most glorious way. We will be one with Christ. That's what Jesus is saying. There's a day coming where you will be one with me. There's a day coming where there will no longer be that. There will be this interconnectedness again of all things. Now, for some of you, you're like, okay, that's great, but what about today? What about today? That, that might be the future of sex, but what about my sexuality today? Well, how do I integrate my sexuality and my spirituality today? Now, there are all kinds of answers to this question, but I think it has to start here. It has to start with an understanding and a, and a real experience of the love of God. Like a real tangible experience. Uh, two weeks ago, I was, on a, uh, I was on a personal retreat. And um, I read, I, I spent time uh, praying and, and fasting and preparing for this series. And I read several books. I was reading a lot, of, a lot during this time and thinking deeply and doing some writing and all this other stuff. And a book that was on my list to read and I finally got around to reading it was uh, a book called War of Loves, The War of Loves by a man named David Bennett, who, is a, who was a, a gay activist who powerfully meets Jesus in a pub in Sydney, Australia. And the story documents his journey with Jesus and the church 
and the scriptures and a sexuality and it doesn't pull any punches and it's so real and it's so raw and I appreciate this book so much. And at the end, he gives probably one of the most compelling visions I've ever heard of what it means to, to, to live in celibacy. Now, celibacy is a reality for anyone who's not married, pretty much. And he says, and he studied at Oxford, so he's also smart. So he says that uh, the church typically like devalues celibacy around a quote spiritual gift. I don't have the spiritual gift of celibacy. So that's a really wrong way of thinking of it. Anyone who's not married, you are celibate. Now, he writes, today in our culture, the reason why celibacy is a fate worse than death is because we put so much emphasis on sex being our sexuality and romance as love, all of that stuff. So he unpacks that. I don't have to go into that. But what he says is this. This is what like, he, he said this and this shifted something in my heart. I mean, shifted something in my mind, all of that stuff. He did it all. It said, he said, what I'm choosing to do, if you don't understand what celibacy is, I'm choosing to live into the future today. Amen. In the future, I will have complete unity and be married to Jesus. I live in that reality today. We are taught as Christians that we are future people, that we are eschatological people, that we live into the future today, that we pray his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We live in that reality today. So I live with a, with like being in love and in unity with Jesus. And I was like, wow, okay. That seems, that seems like a lot. That seems like I want to, I want to experience, and I I was, I was actually praying even for my own life. Like I want to experience uh, the love of God like this. Like he, he speaks very passionately about the love of God. And so that was one of my prayers on this retreat. I was just praying that I would encounter the love of God. And, and, and so, you know, day one happened. And I, to be honest, like one of my prayers was like, I want to feel near you, God. And I want to hear you speak because I, I feel like I haven't heard that in a while. So I went away and was praying and reading and spent time in this little monastery and then more reading. And I mean, all very tranquil. You're like, if there was a setting for this to happen, this would be it. And day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. And then day three, I'm leaving on day three. And um, I get up and I spend time praying in the morning. And something happens that probably hasn't happened maybe, I don't know, ever. Um, the, I thought I've experienced the love of God before, but not, nothing ever happened like this in my own life personally. I just started weeping. I don't, I don't, if you know me, I don't cry. Like, I try. I'll pinch myself sometimes and get tears out of my eyes, but I just don't <laughs> cry. And, um, and I just started weeping. I've, this is the third time I've cried in my adult life. The third time. And, um, and um, I'm just weeping. And it's not like, you know, sometimes when you do something that you don't normally do, like cry, you have this added by experience. So you, you see yourself crying and you stop crying because you're looking at yourself crying. You're like, I can't cry. That sort of thing. But I didn't have that. And I was just, I felt like the, 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 the love of God, the veil that, was really thin between God and I. And I was, I was thanking him that he died for me, that Christ died for me, that he redeemed me, that he loves me, that he knows me. And it was insanely powerful. And I think for like a moment, I understood this love right here is a higher love. It's a greater love than I have for Ashley. It's a greater love than I've ever experienced with Ashley. It's a greater love that I have for my daughter Juniper. It's a greater love that she has for me, that she has for Ashley. It's a higher love than all of that. And as I was reflecting on Bennett's words, I was understanding this is what he means. Is there teaching? Is there theology around it? Yes, of course there is. But what we need more than anything is like to live in the future. That could be a good theological thing, but we need to experience that. And the thing is, is, not only is this theologically true, but this it can be experienced. Paul prays for this for the church in Ephesus. He prays that they would come to know the love of Christ. He, pray, he says that in Romans that this is possible, that we can come to know the, 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 the height, the breadth, the, the love of Christ that we can't be separated from, that we can know this love. And so as a part of this series, I want to, to begin to start to ask the question to God, can we come to know your love that way? It might happen on a Sunday morning. It might happen, I think, powerfully it happens through music. I think it happens through worship, of course. But that would be our prayer. 
Maybe if we're fasting on Wednesdays, that becomes our prayer that we fast and pray through. Um, that we and others around us would really experience the love of God poured out for us. We can know things theologically. We can debate theologically. We might have all of that. That's great. What we need, what we need also is the powerful manifested love of God poured out in our hearts through the power of the Spirit. That's what we need. And, if you, and we need to make room for those in our church. There are a lot who feel disconnected and lonely and sexed, cut off, cut off from community, cut off. And I think it starts with God showing us powerfully that we're not, that we're, he's near, that he knows what we're going through, that he's a personal Lord, that he's our God. And from there needs to flow deep, rich friendship, community, and figuring out how do we live in the future, to quote the very last point of that article today, where romantic love and sex get devalued a little bit, right set a little bit in our culture because we put so much value on it, and friendship, generativity, those parts of our sexuality get expressed. Let's pray. Lord, as uh, we move into a time of just praying and responding to you now, um, I just want to pray that you would powerfully meet us, God. That it wouldn't be uh, emotional sentimentality. It would be honest, real. Just here we are, Lord. Um, Would you meet with us? Would you powerfully pour out your love to the person here who is like, who might feel uh, angry at you? who might feel cut off from you, who might feel disconnected from the church, feeling the church has rejected them. I pray that you would make your presence known here, God. We're asking for it. We set our, we set ourselves apart. And I just say, Lord, in this time now, make yourself known. In the next four weeks, make yourself known. We seek to exalt you, Christ, and your gospel. And that gospel that says, whosoever believes in me will have eternal life. Whosoever no matter what, who, how we are, what we've done, all of it, Lord, would you, would you make your love known in Christ's name? Amen.